Disney's Disneyland, the story of the animated drawing. Now your host, Walt Disney. Most of us are inclined to think of the animated cartoon as a modern invention, like the airplane or the automobile. But actually, the idea of imparting life and motion to still pictures is as ancient as man himself. But in our time, we've seen this dream come true. The animated drawing has matured and has taken its rightful place among the fine arts. This picture is from our Nutcracker Suite, one of the uh, musical numbers in our production, Fantasia. Art galleries all over the country exhibited many such setups from that production. People bought them as they would any other kind of painting. Yet consider this fact. This picture moved. It's true it only represents one frame of a motion picture film. But delicate and intricate though it is, it came to life. Now to do this would have been only wishful thinking as short a time ago as the 1920s. And yet the groundwork for this accomplishment was laid long before that. Now we in the profession know that we owe a debt of gratitude to our forerunners. And it is to these pioneers that we dedicate this program on the history of the animated drawing. Their story is part of what is contained in this book, The Art of Animation. Compiling this volume has been a pet project with us here at the studio. It took considerable time and careful research. Herein you can read about the artists who dreamed and experimented had their failures and successes, but somehow never gave up trying to breathe life and movement into the inanimate picture. In effect, this is a history of our craft. It begins in prehistoric times with the artistic efforts of our first shaggy ancestors, the cavemen. Here's a reproduction of a wall painting found in the famous caves of Lescaux in France. Apparently the caveman artist was trying to depict an animal in action the only way he knew how, by drawing it in a running position. At the same time, give or take a few thousand years, in a cave near Altamira in northern Spain, another artist was at work. Note the double pair of legs. Now, if he had been able to alternate these leg positions, as we can with our camera, he would have achieved the miracle of animation. Primitive, of course, like himself but basically correct. Here we have an Egyptian wall decoration of about 2000 BC. This mural of two wrestlers has almost the appearance of a strip of film. If we again take certain liberties and skip from pose to pose, we here also achieve animation of sorts. Around the year 1500 A.D., among the great men of the Italian Renaissance was Leonardo da Vinci, artist and inventor. Here is his diagram on which he just intended to show the proportions of the human figure. But our camera can make it animate. By emphasizing certain positions of the figure, it moves and dances. And Leonardo da Vinci becomes an honorary pioneer of the animation industry. However, so far in our history, no one had actually caused a drawn image to appear to move. True animation awaited the recognition of a strange trait of the human eye. This is a principle known as the persistence of vision. Way back in 1824, a Frenchman by the name of Paul Roger demonstrated this with a simple toy called a thaumatrope. It's, the name was derived from the Greek, meaning wheel of magic. There's a different picture on each side of the disc. When the disc is twirled, the eye retains for a split second the after image of each of the pictures. And so we do not see the separate pictures, but a combined impression. Thus, by causing the observer to see a picture that did not exist, Roger's thaumatrope clearly demonstrated the principles of persistence of vision. Yet this toy did not really generate any feeling of animation. Credit for doing that for the first time goes to Joseph Plateau, who invented a device that actually seemed to make 
pictures move. He called it a phenakistoscope. Now, another word derived from the Greek meaning optical deceiver. A series of images are drawn in progressive positions of an action. Each picture is separated from the other by a slit. I'll show you how it works. The disc is held up to a mirror so that the reflected drawings can be seen through the slits. Now when the disc is spun, the static figures change their positions. They definitely appear to move. This germ of the motion picture was a sensation in its day. A uh, variety was provided for the one-man audience by uh, extra discs containing other actions. Now here's an innovation. You can enjoy one action on the outer rim and another on the center. Looks like in 1832 they already had the double feature. Plateau's phenakistoscope led to many other animation novelties. One of them was the zoetrope or wheel of life. It was a drum rather than a disc. Now the drawings were put on long strips. The strips were interchangeable. They were placed inside the drum, below the slits. Now when viewed from the slits, the drawings definitely appeared to come to life when the drum was spun. these one-man peep shows came a very remarkable machine that was able to project moving drawings onto a screen for audiences. And this was even before the invention of the motion picture camera and projector. Now here on my movie Ola, I have a film that reenacts the story of Emil Reynaud and his remarkable theater optique. Renault was a painter of lantern slides who lived in a small apartment in Paris in the year 1877. He was intrigued with the early animation devices. He studied and read all he could about them in the scientific periodicals of his day. Finally, he invented a machine of his own called the Praxinoscope, which borrowed the interchangeable action strips from the zoetrope. But he replaced the slits on the zoetrope with mirrors set edge to edge around a revolving center. Each individual picture on the outer rim is reflected on one of the mirrors. And here, with the charm that still enchants and delights us today, the images glide and flow along with a mysterious life of their own. Still, Renault wasn't satisfied. Soon he hit upon the idea of drawing his pictures on strips of black paper. This enabled him to combine a background on a separate card with the action drawings. The complete effect was viewed through a tiny proscenium. He called his improved machine the Theater Praxinoscope. Here one could see a vaudeville show in miniature. Just a simple change of scenery, a new cast of characters, and a brand new act is ready to start. It doesn't matter that the entire performance lasts only a few seconds, or that the strip is made up of only 12 poses. It still keeps you spellbound. You want to see it again and again. But to Reno's mind, this still left much to be desired. He wanted something better, and bigger. At last he had it. The short picture strips had been expanded to a long band containing 500 hand-painted slides drawn on transparent gelatin. Small holes punched between each image foreshadowed the perforations on modern film. 
Each hole meshes into the teeth of the large wheel, rotating at the same speed as the 36 mirrors at the center. Each individual image is lighted up separately. By an interplay of mirrors and lenses, the ray of light is reflected back to a mobile mirror, which in turn projects the enlarged image onto a screen. By adapting the principle of the magic lantern to his machine, he was able to project the background onto the same screen. Here, his actors were life-size. Here, he could almost create the illusion of reality. From a toy in the home, his idea had grown into a form of public entertainment. Renault called it the Theater Optique. Here the people of Paris could view a complete quarter of an hour performance. In the course of his career as a showman, he produced seven different shows, all accompanied by appropriate mood music. For more than 10 years, Renault worked here behind the screen that separated the audience from his primitive projection booth. And in this period, he played to over a half million delighted patrons. safe to assume that not many of his viewers ever gave a thought to the vast amount of effort that lay behind what they were seeing. And it is quite probable that not even Reno himself had the slightest inkling of the heights toward which his first true prototype of the animated cartoon was pointing the way. By the end of the 19th century, Drawings had been made to appear to move, but only in a limited way. Progress was again waiting on invention. And this came with the development of the motion picture film and the motion picture camera. This new medium opened the door to further experiments with the animated drawing. In the year 1906, J. Stuart Blackton made a short film novelty called Humorous Phases of Funny Faces. The drawings were made with chalk on a blackboard. The movement was affected by erasing and redrawing parts of the figures. Stop motion photography created the action. Windsor McKay, the famous newspaper cartoonist, made several noteworthy experiments with animation. Among them was his film, Gertie the Dinosaur. Gertie was not presented in the way modern films are shown today. It was part of a vaudeville act in which Windsor McKay appeared on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Gertie the Dinosaur. I will speak to Gertie, and she will do everything that I ask her to. 
Come on, Gertie. Come on out and take a pretty bow. That's a good girl. Now come on up front here. Out of the audience, Gertie. Stop that nonsense. Let's get on with the act. Now, will you be a good girl and make your bow to the audience? Okay, okay. That's enough. Don't overdo it. Now, raise your right foot. Come on, Gertie. That's good. Now raise your left foot. Your left foot, Gertie. Your left foot. Never mind that sea monster. Your left foot. Come on, Gertie. Now stop acting like a dim-witted dinosaur. Take it easy, Gertie. You're a bad girl. All right. Now stop that crying. Here. Here's a nice pumpkin for you. Good, huh? Now will you raise your left foot? Thank you. My, you have an appetite today. Aren't you afraid you'll spoil your figure? Well, let's get on with the act. Good. Gertie, pay attention. Oh, it's Jumbo. Now, Gertie, don't hurt Jumbo. He's just trying to be friendly. Aren't you ashamed? Well, folks, that's how dinosaurs are. Unpredictable. But she does have her gentler side. As a matter of fact, she's a student of the dance. And if the orchestra will play a tune, she'll perform for you. Right on her feet, isn't she? Oh, by the way, this is the latest dance. The dinosaur dip. Now, Gertie, you had that coming to you. Now, roll over and play dead. That's fine. Now get up. Come on, get up. Let's get on with the act. Up. Up on your feet. Hey, Gertie, look at that four-winged lizard. Did you see that? You're not in the habit of saying things, are you? How'd you like to have a little drink, huh? Well, there's the lake. Go on, take a little drink. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Gertie will show you that she's not afraid of me, and take me for a ride. Alley up. Windsor McKay's Gertie and other animation novelties stimulated a great public interest and created a demand for this new medium. This in turn encouraged other pioneers to creative efforts that in time led to the establishment of the animated cartoon as an industry. One of the pioneers, J.R. Bray, invented the basic patents for animated cartoon production. For a time, the Bray studios were practically the creative center of the industry. His Colonel He's a Liar was the first animated cartoon character to appear in a series of films. And there was Raoul Barry, Canadian artist and painter. Among the many cartoon characters he created was Silas Bumpkin, who appeared in his early film series called The Grouch Chasers. And 
this is Earl Hurd, who invented an improvement valuable in speeding up production of animated cartoons. His pioneer film effort was the Bobby Bump series. And there was Pat Sullivan's cartoon character, Felix the Cat. This characteristic walk, animated by Sullivan's collaborator, Otto Mesmer, became a laugh-provoking trademark. These, then, are some of the pioneers who led the way. By the mid-1920s, the animated cartoon industry was flourishing. This was the era of the silent screen. And although pictures were made without sound, they were seldom shown in silence. Music played a vital part in their presentation. Here is Oliver Wallace, who in 1910 was the first to accompany silent pictures on the theater organ. Today, he is still creating music for pictures as one of our staff composers. Through the magic of makeup, we'll try to take him back to the days of the silent pictures. It's coming, but we need to take off about 10 more years. 10? Can't you take off at least 15? Yes, I'm just the thing here to do it. Oh, why didn't somebody tell me about these things? That's about right, but there's still something missing. Oh, I'd forgotten about those, you know. Thank you. How's that? Now that we've taken Oliver Wallace back to the period, he will demonstrate how the theater organ was used to create the music and sound effects for silent pictures. Are you ready, Ollie? All right, quiet, everybody. Roll them. The picture is by another pioneer of the industry, Max Fleischer. An innovation of his films was the combination of human and cartoon characters. Max Fleischer himself appeared in these pictures with Coco the Clown. In 1938, animated cartoons had improved to a point where audience interest could be sustained for more than six or seven minutes. And so, 
the cartoon feature became a possibility. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was our first feature-length cartoon. And then, The Adventures of Pinocchio followed. These are examples of the storytelling pictures. That is the uh, animated illustration type of cartoon. This has been an ABC Television Network film presentation.